going uh, through the series of Psalms. If you're brand new, this is your first time, and we're in the Psalms. Last week, we started what is a two-week deal on the Psalms of the Messiah, the Messianic Psalms. If you missed last week, no big deal. Free podcast, say free. free. Podcast, okay, or the CDs out there. Pick it up because that's the foundation for tonight. Summar- summarize last week, Psalm 22, 1,000 years before Jesus comes, God speaks through a man named David who was king. David was a man who loved God, whose heart was after God. He heard from God. He speaks a psalm, Psalm 22. Happens to be exactly how Jesus, who is the Messiah, who's the anointed one, who's the one sent from God, exactly how Jesus is gonna die. Exactly, to the letter. Thousand years before it happens, God speaks. It comes to pass, we know it to be truth. It's one of those proofs that we have that Jesus is who he says he is. You look at the past, this is who it would look, how it would look like. This is who it would be. You see it in Jesus, you're amazed. I'm amazed. Uh, and we see that all throughout the Old Testament. But tonight we want to pull out a little bit of the implications. Because some of you are wondering, like I am wondering and have wondered, all right, I have the Bible, which is the written record of God. God's given that to me. But in the Bible, all sorts of people are predicting these things. David is a prophet. He speaks the word of God. It comes to pass. All throughout the New Testament, God has the apostles, the 12 sent ones. They speak the word of God. It is the scripture. God is speaking, God is speaking, God is speaking. And I want to hear from God. And so sometimes we wonder, all right, if I've got the book, I know I can hear from God. Is this the only way that I can hear from God? I want to hear from him. Is the only way that I hear from God reading the Bible or the way God spoke in the past before Jesus came on the scene Does God still do that kind of stuff? You see, when Jesus was on the earth, and you see when Jesus left the earth in his early followers, this this thing called prophecy, that's exactly what David did, Psalm 22. Can we experience anything like that? What does it look like to hear from God? And can we, as followers of Jesus, can we be a part of God speaking? Not a light subject for a Friday afternoon in the baking sun, I must have confessed. But, but I think that this is an often overlooked in the Western church, of those of us who live in post-Europe or American Western civilization, uh, wonder and are skeptical because we have the Big Hair Channel and all the weirdness. You know, we've got all the TBN, CBN, IBN, whatever. You know, like we got all the stuff. And if you've been around Christianity for a while, you may have seen people saying, God is saying this. This is what God says. And Some of us wonder, is any of that legitimate? Can God use us to communicate his message to people? Uh, No light topic. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. We're going to be all over the Bible. So again, finger in the table of contents. Another one in Jeremiah 31. Uh, This is Jeremiah, another prophet, who's speaking, predicting what's to come. And here's what he has to say, verse 31 of chapter 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. So he's speaking on behalf of God. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant or agreement that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. God had made an agreement. We've studied this time and again that God had spoken to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless the nations through you. I'm going to, the whole earth is going to know about me through you. God made an agreement. Live in my way. Experience my blessing. We know the story of the Bible because we know our own story. We jack it up. We run from God. God calls out to us. We say, God, I'm sorry. Then we jack it up next week. Then we jack it up next week. Then we jack it up next week. That's their story. That's our story. But God says there's going to be a new agreement. Now, what does that new agreement lead to? Verse 33. But this is the covenant or agreement that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds. I'll write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying... Know the Lord, for they shall, and what's the word there say? All, or they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, 
says the Lord. And here's, here's why he says this. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So this is that follow-up thought to Psalm 22. Uh, when you see the picture of the cross, Jesus dying for our sin, rising again to give us life, it's prophesied by Jeremiah, again before the coming of Jesus, what's going to happen post the coming of Jesus. There will be a new way of knowing God. Now, so when we look at the Old Testament, the prophets say, thus says the Lord, right? That's how anyone knew about God. The only way you knew about God, because he didn't speak through everyone, even though you love God, didn't mean that God could speak through you. You had to be a prophet. You had to be a priest. You had to be a king. Only a few people heard from God. And the whole community knew about God through these few select people. The distinctive, what Jeremiah is predicting, when that new covenant comes, when Jesus comes and makes a new and better agreement, when he goes to the cross, Psalm 22, what he is going to do is establish a deeper or more intimate relationship with all of his followers. So much that he says, no more shall they say, so, you know, you're, no, shall, no more shall another man say, you can know the Lord. Now what is he saying? There shouldn't be teachers, we shouldn't do this? No, no. What he's saying is there is going to be a distinctive character within you. You're going to know the Lord, not just externally from a written law and a written code and a written, you're going to know the law on your hearts, on your mind. God's going to embed truth inside of you. And so Jeremiah is predicting this closeness so that all men from the least to the greatest, they're all going to have access. Now the beauty uh, that we often take for granted is that we are living in that reality. Because of the coming of Jesus, because these prophecies are true, now you and I, we can know the Lord. When I woke up this morning, I opened my Bible. And I just went to the scriptures. I'm doing the Bible reading plan. If you go to Solid Rock, there's a Bible reading plan. First Chronicles 29 and Psalm 34 and uh, First Thessalonians 2 and Proverbs 3. And, and I was just reading my Bible. And I'm telling you, it's not always this way, but this morning it was mind-blowing. Just reading the scriptures, I saw these connections. Like, I've read this before. I studied it. But it was like alive, so much so, as I'm reading First Chronicles and I'm reading Psalm 34, a guy who I haven't spoken to in a while, as I was reading both of those, I thought, wow, look at this, look at the characteristics of the man or woman who walks with God. Look what God says in Psalm 34 and First Chronicles 29. Look what God promises to that person. And it's a friend of mine in Wenatchee, Washington. He helped with a festival we did a few years ago. And so much so that he came to mind and I just... I, I opened my laptop, popped an email, and said, bro, read, read these two chapters. They really spoke to my heart this morning, and as soon as I read them, I saw you. I saw this in your life, and, and I want to encourage you. This is what God says to all of us who live according to his ways, and, and I haven't gotten a response yet because I know he's on vacation, but the word of God is alive. Now, the only reason I can say that that legitimately happened is because the, the prophecy of, of Jeremiah 31 has come to pass. New agreement, God's writing truth on my mind and in my heart, I can know God. So in the Old Testament, thus saith the Lord, few. But now in this new covenant, we have a closeness. I'm going to suggest something to you that may be, it may sound strange and it, it may not be true, so we're going to look at it to see if it is true. I think that God wants to speak truth within the community, to other people who know Jesus through your lips more than you give God credit for. I think part of what God has done in bringing this agreement, this new covenant, this, this new life with Jesus Christ, one of the possibilities that we sometimes overlook is we think pastor, preacher, upfront speaker, someone else, that's their job to communicate God's truth to me. It's my job to listen. Maybe... God wants to stretch us a bit and remind us tonight as we look at, at, at the scriptures that he wants to speak truth through your lips. Through the scriptures, but through your lips. And there is a specific way that God has chosen to reveal that, and we're gonna eventually get there. But Jeremiah 31 sets the foundation. Now go to the New Testament, go to the right, go to Hebrews chapter one. I promise you, eventually we'll get to the text that specifically says how God wants to speak through all of us, share truth, share the words of God through our lips, all of us, pastor, preacher, 
new Christian, older Christian. Uh, but Hebrews chapter 1 sets the guidelines. We could go straight to that text, but I think a little bit of background is going to help keep us from getting a wrong view of what I'm talking about. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 in the first few verses. It says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, speaking of the Old Testament, has in these last days, in this, er in this era of the new covenant, in this new agreement with Jesus, spoken to us by his what? Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. So he's giving, now in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews is gonna lay out this case that Jesus is the most supreme of all people. He's bigger than Moses, he's bigger than angels, he's bigger than everybody. But at the outset, speaking to people who understood the Jewish law, he says straight up in the beginning of his letter, he doesn't waste any time, God spoke through the prophets of old, and that's important that you understand the word of the prophets. But now, how do you really understand what God is about and what he's saying? It's through one person, through Jesus Christ. God has spoken through his son who went to the cross, purged our sin, now is seated on high at the right hand of the Father. He is majestic. He is Lord of all. He is the king of the universe. Jesus is God. So if you want to know what God has to say to you, all you have to do is look at Jesus. This is going to become important. How can I know the will of God? How can I know God's plan for me? How can I know exactly what God wants me to be doing right now? One way, the supreme way, the most important way, is that you look at Jesus. You look at Jesus in the morning. You look at Jesus in the afternoon. You look at Jesus at night. If you invest your life pursuing in the scriptures Jesus Christ, you will not have to wonder about what to think, about how to act, about what to invest your life in, about what to pursue, about what to dream. If you want to know, if I want to know. Remember, before Jesus, you had to wait for the prophet to speak the word of the Lord. Now, the true prophet, the ultimate prophet, Jesus Christ, God, has spoken. He came in the flesh, and so I have, you have access to the very thoughts of God in the scriptures. You want to know what it means to follow God? Look at Jesus. And I think that some of us overlook the obvious. If I'm wondering, how can I be more like God wants me to be? Spend your day in the scriptures just looking at Jesus. And then look at some of Jesus' followers in the scriptures. Look at Peter, look at James, look at John. Uh, look, look at the early apostles. Read church history. Look at men and women of God who were before you. We don't have to wonder the will of God. It's spoken in Jesus. But that doesn't completely fulfill because in Jeremiah 31, God said that he's going to write his thoughts on our minds, his will on our hearts. If I look at Jesus, that doesn't necessarily have internalized it. Now flip to the right to 1 John 2. In 1 John 2, we're going to see John, one of the closest followers of Jesus, as he's writing the scriptures, actually writes a fulfillment of Jeremiah 31. And then this is going to begin to help us to understand how you and I can be used by God to speak the very words of God to other people. Sounds ethereal, sounds crazy, but hopefully by tonight it'll at least become clearer. 1 John 2, verse 24. I'll back up to verse 23 just to give you the context. He says, Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either, he who acknowledges the Son has the Father. He's making an argument. We're jumping in the middle here. He's making an argument about the Father and the Son are one. Like Hebrews, Father and the Son are one. Verse 24 says, Therefore, let that abide in you, the truth that Jesus is God. Let that abide in you, which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. Pause for a second. Remember in Jeremiah 31, new covenant, new agreement's going to come. You're going to have the thoughts of God. You're going to have the wisdom of God. You're going to have the words of God in your mind, written on your heart. 
Now John is saying, in Christ, if you embrace the gospel, and that's what he's saying, the things that you heard from the beginning, it was the gospel message preached for us. We could say broadly, the scriptures, if you internalize and believe and put your life on the scriptures, right? The revelation of Jesus, cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation, this is the gospel. Not just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the good news sayings of Jesus, the life of Jesus. The whole word of God, all 66 books, Old Testament, New Testament, this is the gospel. This is the story of God. If you hold on to this, you will abide in the Father and in the Son. Mysteriously, you will be interconnected with the reality and the true nature of God who made heaven and earth. Some of us think, well, I just thought I was like just a regular Christian. There are no regular Christians. This is mystical. This is powerful. You are in the Son. I don't know how, but you are. You are in the Father. You are connected by the Holy Spirit of God, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are in the middle of all that. You're not just this distant person that Jesus emails from time to time. You are in relationship, in fellowship this morning, reading the scriptures, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We're all hanging out on my one couch. We all fit on my couch. Not literally, but sometimes we forget that, that when, we're, when we're with God, we're with God. Now, when we see that that's the relationship, let's continue, verse 25. This is the promise that he has promised us, what? Eternal life. The life of God is the promise of God, and we have it now. Verse 26, these things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. Now, some people are going to try to push you away. But the anointing which you have received from him, from God, abides in you. So it's internal. You do not need anyone to teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning how many things? All things. And is what? True. And is not a lie. And just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. So what Jesus is promising here, through through John the Gospel writer, is that when we're in fellowship with God, if we'll just wake our eyes up, you have the anointing. Now, the, he uses this word twice in 1 John, and anointing is a metaphor he's using for the person of the Holy Spirit. So you could rightfully say, because the, the anointing, the chrisma, is in reference to what the Old Testament king, prophet, priest had, anointed by God. We have the Holy Spirit of God. You will be in relationship with the Father and Son. How? How will you be in relationship with the Father and Son? John says, you have the anointing. You have the Holy Spirit who is what? In you. Didn't Jesus say in John's gospel, I'm going to the Father, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to give you the what? The Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the one who comes alongside. The Holy Spirit will be with you and what? in you. So if you are born anew, if you have embraced the gospel, you have eternal life, you have the Holy Spirit because you have the Holy Spirit in this mystical union. I don't get it, but I get it. I can't rationalize it, but it's totally real. That the anointing is in me. So he's not saying you don't need a teacher. Don't misinterpret the text. He is saying you have a teacher in you. So other people who share the scriptures are bearing witness because those who are followers of Jesus, I have the Holy Spirit. So as I've studied the scriptures, I, I'm trying to discern by the power of the Holy Spirit, what does God want to tell you tonight? But you know what? You have the Holy Spirit. And so as you hear the word of God preached, as you read the scriptures for yourself, you don't have to just rely on someone else to tell you the will of God. You, because you are in union with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you have the Holy Spirit in you, you can know what you need to know when you need to know it. But I'm going to go one step further because in 1 Corinthians 12, and go there if you would, go to the left, to 1 Corinthians 12. In 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, you see this huge discussion about how the Holy Spirit works out speaking truth through my lips. So if you ever wonder, can God use me? Can God use me by his power to speak his truth to ordinary circumstances, to ordinary people at ordinary times? 
Now, I'm not talking about church stuff. I'm not talking about me telling you, thus saith the Lord. I'm talking about you. You get your buddies. You're in maybe a house church or you're in your dorm and you're studying the scriptures. Can God by his Holy Spirit speak through any one of you who are followers of Jesus? The answer is absolutely yes. Some of us have never heard that before. It's brand new, brand new concept. Others have equated it with kookiness and people on TV flinging things at people and all of a sudden getting a metamorphic voice where I'm talking like this and I'm saying, thus says the Lord. I mean like, and like I'm possessed by some weirdness. And, and we've heard that and we think, no way, I don't want any of that crack cocaine stuff. I don't, I don't want, now, but, now some of us unfortunately have pushed it aside as a joke, irrelevant. But what Paul's gonna discuss with the church that was already experiencing this is that this is beautiful. What we're gonna talk about for the next few minutes is absolutely beautiful, it's mystical, it's practical, and I can't think of any other words with the A-L, but I just made up three. There you go. This is beautiful. Now, all this is ethereal. <laughs> there you go. For so, so much. But I, I'm going I'm to bring it, I'm going to bring it to life. I'm 10 years old. I was talking my dad this morning. Between 10 and 12, so we'll call it 11. Um, <laughs> I'm somewhere in, I can't remember the day. But we're, we couldn't, rem we couldn't peg down the day. We're in church, it's Sunday night, and I, I remember it as if I was 11 years old, which theoretically I am, right? I remember this evangelist came to our church. He's speaking, he's preaching the gospel. End of the service, they're having a little prayer time, like they have the prayer room, prayer thing. He walks straight up to me and my brother. Never met him before, never, never, I didn't know who this guy was. I was just sitting in church trying to take a nap or something. I don't, I don't remember any of it. And he talks to my mom, dad, and says, as I was praying, I, I saw your two children. And, and, and here's what I want to tell you. Speaking to my mom and dad. God has ministry plans for these two boys, me and my older brother. Now, their ministries are going to be totally, uniquely different, but they're both called to God's work. So I'm talking to you, my mom and dad, Miguel and Rosa, and I, I want to tell you in, in God's name, that you have a responsibility to raise these boys and prepare them for God's work. So don't take lightly the ministry that you have of raising these boys in the ways of God because God's going to use them uniquely different, but he's going to use them both. And I remember, I remember standing there thinking, what ever? <laughs> like, what is going on? But you know what? And he prayed for us, and it was a beautiful, it was a beautiful thing. But that stuck with me. And mom and dad, now, now, what we want to discern is, was that guy a kook? Was what he's saying legitimate? And is there value to this understanding that Jesus the Messiah in this new covenant, in this new agreement, has now chosen to give the, the entire family the ability to hear by the Spirit of God words from God so that the life of God will be breathed on all of his people? And now, I want to suggest that he was not a kook and that this, this has been an ordinary part of my Christian experience. Now, we don't talk about this a lot, so I want to give you the right to disagree with everything I'm about to say. And that's totally cool. But just hear it out, and you, like those in Berea in the book of Acts, you search the Scriptures, and you see if what I'm suggesting is reality, all right? Because we're from all different kinds of churches, and some of us have been raised to believe that at the end of the apostolic age, no one knows exactly when that is, at the end of the age of the apostles, that God ceased to speak in a prophetic voice. Now, some, certainly, he used the word, uh-oh, prophecy. Now, what, what is prophecy? I want to give you a basic definition. If you write down nothing else, please, Write this down so you cannot misquote me. So when you go back and say, cuckoo, at least you have facts to back it up. Here's how I understand prophecy, totally ripped off from my good friend, Wayne Gruden, uh, who's a theologian and a Bible teacher and who studied the scriptures on this particular topic. It's real simple. Prophecy is, quote, telling something that God has spontaneously brought to mind. I'll repeat it again. Telling something 
that God has spontaneously brought to mind. So let me bring back that little story. So this guy didn't know me. He didn't plan on coming to speak to, about me and my brother. But as he's praying, he was telling my mom and dad what God had spontaneously brought to mind. He, he, he was in line with Scripture in that we're all called, every parent called to raise up their children in the ways of God. Nothing anti-biblical about that. But he wasn't quoting chapter and verse. He was speaking a word of prophecy. Now, 1 Corinthians 12 outlines how this is supposed to play out. And again, please hear me out first. Don't check out. Hear me out, and then you test the Scriptures for yourself. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 1 and following. says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be what? Ignorant. Now the implication here is that some people are ignorant about spiritual gifts. Verse 2, you know that you were Gentiles, uh, that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Before you were a Christian, these spirits, and the, when you were following idols, you were led by these demonic spirits, is what he's saying. You know what it's like to be led by demons, but you came to Christ. Verse 3, therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. No one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the power of the Holy Spirit. Spirits are real, and you can be led by spirits that are not of God. But he's saying here, those that are led by the Holy Spirit are not like that. Those who confess Jesus is Lord, are, are, those who are following the way of Jesus, are led by the Holy Spirit, not by demons. Verse 4, uh, there are diversity of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but, in the, but it is the same God who works all in all. Verse 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit or through the Holy Spirit, and another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another workings of miracles, to another, and then this word, prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each individually as He will. So I want, I want to outline, we're going to talk about prophecy, but I want to outline five thoughts that you need to think through concerning anything to do with spiritual gifts or a gifts and abilities that are led by the Holy Spirit. And since for some of us, this is brand spanking new, you can, you can guide it by these from the text, but I pulled out these five. Number one, you can be ignorant of God's gifts. You saw that in 12 verse one. He didn't want the apostle, by the Spirit of God, didn't want them to live in ignorance. So some of us have a misguided view, or misunderstand, or just totally discount it. And it's not God's will that you would miss out on anything God has. So God doesn't want ignorance. The second thing, the Holy Spirit expresses ministry in a variety of ways. The Holy Spirit expresses ministry in a variety of ways. So there is not one way. Remember Jeremiah 31? I'm going to put the will, thoughts in their heart, in their minds. How does God do that practically? Well, the New Testament teaches us that there are a variety of ways. And we saw all sorts of, we saw speaking in tongues, we saw uh, interpretation of tongues, we saw prophecy, we saw miracles, we saw gift of healings. We see a variety of activity, but the apostle makes very clear by the Spirit of God, it's one Holy Spirit. It's one God, it's one Father of all. This is not multiple like demons, angels. It's all from God himself in a variety of expressions. The third thing, the gifts are designed to benefit the entire body. Now, that's important. The gifts are designed to benefit the entire body. If you, if you don't believe me, verse 7 says, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all, for everyone. And so whenever God is doing something, He's not just doing it for one or two or three people. As we trust God to be used by Him, He is going to speak to His community by His community. And that's what some of us have forgotten. 
we have, we've allowed a few people in the community to, to be the spokespeople for what God wants to do in the group. And there's nothing wrong with listening to teachers and preachers. God has established people in ministry for a reason. We're all under authority, but we all have the Holy Spirit. And so I just want to suggest to you is that God may be wanting to use you by his Holy Spirit in ways that you have never thought about or that you have never investigated or that you've been pushing off. As a matter of fact, some of you may be used by the Spirit of God now and you just don't realize that's not you. That's God by his Holy Spirit using you. Fourth thing, the Holy Spirit controls who, what, where, when, how. This is not a gift that I attain, you attain. You don't turn it on. Poof, I'm going to put my prophecy on. Come on. You're like, <laughs> what? You know? That's why I get nervous when someone says, you are going to be healed. Wow. Now, I believe that God heals people all the time. But that's, I think, slightly presumptuous to say that I'm going to turn on the gift of healing. When the scriptures say that the Holy Spirit, look at verse 12. Some of you are like, did he really say that? Verse 11. But one in the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as who wills. As he wills. God is the one that works his gifts through his people. Number five. The gifts can be abused or misused. And so this discussion, it, it could be taken totally out of context. That's why, what is the definition of prophecy? You tell me. What is prophecy? All right, telling something that what? Telling like, something that God has spontaneously brought to mind. Right, so don't misquote me and say that. Jose said everyone wants to prophesy every day in between brushing your teeth. Or, don't get, you know, like, don't, don't, don't get, God wants to sometimes. Now, I want to highlight this one gift because we can't do all of them, because I believe that as Paul was telling the church, they were already experiencing this reality. And here's why this is goofy for us. Because in our fellowship, in our Western, rationalistic, intellectual culture that we live in, we're born in, we're not like uh, Eastern culture, Asian culture, African culture, even Latin American culture, that by nature is more sensitive to things spiritual. We think things through, we're methodical, we're planners. Because of that, when we look at these texts, we sometimes go, man, that church was wacko. Well, actually, Corinth was a little wacko. Not because they were using God's gifts, but because some of them were abusing God's gifts. And so when we talk about this, just because you do not see it happening every week does not mean that these realities are not designed for you. It could be that, like verse 1 said, we're just living in ignorance. We're missing out on God's blessing. Now, now let's talk about the gift of prophecy uh, and what prophecy is for. Just go over a couple chapters to chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 4, 14, verse 1. And we're just going to drill out what prophecy is and what prophecy is not. Verse 1 says, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. But the apostle says, by the Holy Spirit of God, he says, but especially that you may prophesy. Now, he's not writing this to the pastor. You've got to know this. He's writing this to the whole community, to the whole church. He's saying, I want you to pursue gifts. This is, this is God's design that you would know how God wants to use you. You're not going to all look the same. God has many gifts. He has many expressions. And he's going to use many of you in many different ways. But he's like, if you're going to look at gifts, I would hope that you would pursue and look at the gift of prophecy. For he who speaks in a tongue, and now he's going to contrast it with tongues. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies, he who tells something that God has spontaneously brought to mind, speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. But he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. He who prophesies edifies the church. So he's just giving a contrast. Nothing wrong with tongues, but he's saying, if you want to really be built up as a church, 
many of you should exercise the spiritual gift of prophecy. You should be open to it because when you prophesy, it's going to edify. The literal word there, it's a construction term. When you as a community uh, prophesy to one another, it's going to be like building a building. You're going to edify. You're going to construct one another in the things of God. This is going to be good. How are you going to instruct one another? You're going to exhort, verse 3, and you're going to comfort by speaking words that are spontaneous. They're not Scripture, but they're in line with Scripture. Like this evangelist. We couldn't figure out who his name was. We don't even know if he's still alive. I'm going to do a little Google search to try to figure out who he was. God used him to help my parents know where God was leading us. That was an encouragement. It was an exhortation. Now, you say, is that real? Uh, August 22 of, two, uh, of 2008, last summer, Luis Palau did this, this festival downtown. Do you remember it? At the time, God was doing all sorts of stuff in, in relocating us back to Portland. I've been serving God for a while. God, uh, about 18 months ago, allowed me to come be a part of this amazing thing. John Mark, Phil, others started to realize God was at work here. They threw out as an elder group, hey, would you consider coming and relocating back to Portland and partnering with us? Let's do ministry together. By the Spirit of God, with a group of elders that are around me, our board of directors of our ministry, we began to pray and realize, wow, this is, this is of the Lord. We don't even get it, but we know this is of the Lord. Let's go for it. That's May of last year. So I want to talk to a guy that I had met in 2000. His name is Miles McPherson. He's a pastor of the Rock Church in San Diego, fantastic evangelist, godly man, amazing preacher. In 2000, when I launched out, I worked for Luis Palau, and I launched out, led by God to begin an evangelistic ministry, I bumped into Miles at a Promise Keepers conference, and we were in a van going to the hotel. In 2000, the Lord used this man, a Christian, who I didn't know. And I said, I'm about to launch out. You have any advice? And he just made the statement, Jose, bigger doors, bigger demons. And let me explain. When you launch out into a new area of ministry, don't be surprised when there's a bigger attack. And he began to explain how God had, had helped him to see that when he started the church. Bigger challenges, bigger struggles, bigger victories. He's like, Jose, be ready. Be ready for attack. And you know what? That was a prophecy to me to exhort and comfort me that what's about to happen is, is led of God. And that's exactly what happened that next year, 2000 to 2001. I had more attacks against my life than I'd experienced prior. God prepared me for it through this word of prophecy. So I wanted to talk to Miles to get his perspective on what would it look like to come and partner with the church. What would it be like? The problem is he's in San Diego and he passes a church of 14,000 people. So he's not available. And so I tried. I know this guy, Tim, who works for him. Tim, could you get, I will fly to San Diego if he will give me a half an hour. No, da, 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 da. So I'm downtown Portland. I know Luis Palau. I get a little backstage pass. I walk over, and who do I see? Miles McPherson. I run over to the table. I'm like, Miles! He's like, freaky. You're like, I'm like, Miles, you are not going to believe. He's like, I know you. I'm like, and I said, let me, let me tell you. But, but, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He didn't know who I was. But, you know, <laughs> so when he's saying, yeah, 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 that means I can't recall. Um, so, so I'm like, I'm explaining the situation, and God, he just puts a smile on this guy's face. And I was like, oh, yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And he lays out, now I'm not going to bother to give you the details of it, but he laid out five things. He says, Jose, let me tell you what God's about to do. And again, I know him, respect him. He didn't know my story. I explained a little bit. And those five things which are in my journal and I look at often, those five things have all come to pass. Every single one of these specific things that he says God is about to lead you into. Boom, 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 boom. And he says, you know what, Jose? I came up to this festival and I didn't know why. I was about to cancel. But this buddy who has a private plane who was coming up and invited me to come, he's like, I didn't want to ditch on him and, you know, and, and make him mad at me. And so I decided to come up, but I prayed this morning, God, will you give me an assignment? He's like, you were the assignment. God sent me here to speak to you. I'm like, yes, you're totally right. <laughs> and you know what? That's, that's the beauty. Now, I'm not suggesting that this happens all the time. I could count in my 30 years of following Jesus 
that it's happened on maybe a dozen occasions while God has used someone to prophesy something specific in my life. Now, what prophecy is? It's for two things. Write this down. What is prophecy for? From 1 Corinthians 14, we see that prophecy is for building up believers. God chooses to use words that come from God spontaneously brought up God chooses to use people, and he may want to choose to use you. In, now, though, this seems like, wow, you know, like, this is crazy. It could be in simple things, words of exhortation, words of comfort, that you think are just your natural words. God can use those to explain his plan. My friend Colin James, he works for Luis Palau, and I trust him. I know him. I've known him for 15 years. I was driving my car. We moved here in January. We didn't know what to do with our Explorer, so I left it in Charlotte. I realized, duh, I need it. Flew over, went to drive it back. I'm getting ready for a board of directors meeting, getting ready to, to, to lay out this next year of ministry. I'm just praying. I use it as a driving prayer retreat. So I'm driving for four days, and so I'm just praying. I've got CDs, I've got teachings. Just, God, will you speak to me? My friend Colin, this January, calls me up. He says, I was reading Habakkuk 2.2. I was reading Exodus 11 this morning, and I don't know where this is from, but I was thinking of you, and this is what God wants you to know. Boom, 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 boom. I'm like, pull over so I don't get into a car accident. I got into a car accident anyway later on, but that's another story. <laughs> but that was, another, that was ice and bad tires. But, but I'm like, Colin, I am driving in a car because I want to hear from God about the direction of ministry for this year and what you just said is completely in alignment with what God has been teaching me and what he's been showing me in the scriptures. And I was just amazed and I was built up and I was encouraged because God uses people. Now, Colin's not a pastor. Colin's not on staff at a church. He's what they would call an ordinary Christian, which is, there is no such term. You're not ordinary. You're full of the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God may want to use some of you at some points to prophesy, to speak into the lives of other people. The second thing that we see that prophecy is for, it's for engaging non-believers. Jump down to verse 24. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 24. It says, But if all prophesy an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he's convicted by all. And thus, this is what happens when we're in a community that, speaks the word of God, speaks the truth of God spontaneously as God leads us. When, when, when God reveals himself through ordinary people, what's going to happen? Verse 25. And thus the secret things of his heart are revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. When we choose to open ourselves for God to speak through us, we don't manipulate it, we don't choose when, we don't choose how, but we ask God, God, I wanna be used by you. It's amazing. I was speaking at a church we were part of, Meadow Springs Community Church, some years ago. I'm giving a report because I just came back from Africa. And I, I'm, I was given five minutes, so I stand up to give my five minutes. I'm walking to the front to go to the microphone, and the Lord in his goodness says, Jose, there's somebody here that doesn't believe I exist, and I want them to know that I exist. So simply tell them, I exist. Okay. So I get up. Hey, I'm, this is great. It's great to be back. And we're in Uganda. Well, off, da, 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 da. Oh, by the way, um, one of you, you're here, and you're wondering if God truly exists. And what he wants you to know, he exists. As a matter of fact, he just told me that. If, if that's you, talk to me afterwards. I'd love to give you more on how you can know this God. And I sat down thinking, I am an idiot. <laughs> and I'm going to get kicked out of this church. And oh my gosh. I sit down. Afterwards, this dude makes a beeline. I saw him from across the room. You, you. He's like. Now he was white, but he was like a ghost white. He's like, can we talk? I'm like, yes. So we go to the side room, right? <laughs> we go to the side room and no lie. His name is Ryan. He, he's married to Celeste. He had just had a baby. He grew up in church, saw a bunch of baloney, phony, wacko stuff. He said it must be all weird, man-made. I don't want anything to do with it. His dad had been 
bugging him to go to church. That Sunday, he said, all right, I'll go to church. He sat in church thinking, I don't believe any of this exists. I don't believe any of this is real. Then this wacko Puerto Rican gets up and says, and you know what? He repented of his sin. He confessed Jesus Christ. He became a child of God. Not, no, 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 don't, do not clap because Jose is a cool guy because Jose is not a cool guy. What, what is cool is that the Holy Spirit chooses to speak through ordinary people. And what would happen if we were a community that just embraced the Holy Spirit? What would happen? Now, a couple of things before we go that, that prophecy is not. Okay, because then we're thinking, dude, you mean I see this chick. She looks hot. I come up and I say, God told me that you are fine and divine and mine. Ladies, here's what you say. Quote me. I'm so glad you, you said that because God told me this morning that I would meet an idiot and I just did. And you prove that God still speaks. Anyway, don't do that. <laughs> First Thessalonians 5. Go to the right real quick. All right. This is a serious teaching interspersed with comedy. First Corinthians 5, and I want, I, want, I, want to, I want to tell you what prophecy is not. First, uh, first, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians 5, go to the right. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 19, and then we're going to see if God will speak to us. So don't freak out. Just hang in there. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. This is very short. I love these statements. These are straight up. New York style statements. You don't fluff around, you just say it. Verse 19, do not quench the spirit. <laughs> That's pretty straight up. 20, do not despise prophecies. We quench the spirit when we despise and make light of God speaking through people. 21, test all things, hold fast to what is good. Three things that prophecy is not. Number one, it's not trivial. It's not lighthearted. This is, this, this is the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. It's not my ministry. It's the ministry of the Spirit. It's not trivial. So you don't need a prophecy to choose whether Taco Bell or Chipotle or Baja Fresh. You don't need a prophecy for that. Just choose and avoid Taco Bell. Yeah, um, <laughs> unless you only have a dollar. But, um, do not, but second thing, prophecy is not Scripture. Prophecy is not Scripture. So what do we do? You do not test the scripture. That's what it says, do not despise prophecies. Test all things. You don't test the scripture. Scripture is true. You test me teaching you. So I encourage you, test everything I just said. Get the podcast, go to the scriptures. Test it for yourself. So, we, so prophecy is not scripture. So third thing, prophecy is not perfect. Prophecy is not perfect. And it doesn't mean that if you're led by the Holy Spirit of God, you're going to always get it right. And this is where we need some grace. We need to give, some, we need to give grace. Sometimes we don't exactly get it right, and that's okay. I taught things 10 years ago that now I would say, eh, it wasn't heresy, but it wasn't exactly as clean and neat as I thought. Over 10 years, my opinion has changed. And so I hope that people will give me grace that I'm a learner. I'm growing in this. I'm, I haven't arrived yet. And so when it comes to any and every spiritual gift, we can't expect perfection. Now I'm going to rattle off five very quick practical applications. If you believe this is true, five very quick application points that you maybe can begin to discern, is God using this in my life or does God want to use me this way? Number one, make room for God to speak to you. That's all that prophecy is, is, is another way. God speaks through his son, Hebrews 11, uh, Hebrews 1, 1 to 3. Hebrews 1, he speaks through his son. Any prophecy that is not in alignment with the son of God, the teachings of the son of God, the life of the son of God, throw it out. Just throw it out. Don't worry about it. Test it. But make room for God to speak in unique ways. Second thing, make room for God to speak through you. God may want to use you this way, not kooky, not weird, beautiful. This morning, by the mystery of God, I think he gave me something, a word of exhortation, encouragement, this prophecy based on scripture to my friend Steve in Wenatchee, Washington. 
And that's totally cool. And I pray it's a blessing for him. Number three, be gracious as we figure it out. Be gracious. And if someone comes and says, you know, I, th I think that God impressed me and so, such and such. Don't say, well, I don't believe it. So get out of my face. Like, be gracious and just say, thank you. And then you just test it. If it's not from God, don't go back and say, liar. You know, like, <laughs> just encourage one another that, you know what, I haven't seen that come to pass. Or I went to the scriptures and I'm just not sure if that's for me. But thank you. Thank you for being bold enough to, to speak that out. Number four, fall in love with the scriptures. You don't have to wait for a prophecy to hear from God. And that's the main point. You do not have to wait for a prophecy to hear from God. You can hear from God every day. Fall in love with the scriptures. If God chooses to use a, a person to speak some truth that's in line with the scriptures, gravy. It's perfect. Wonderful. Encouraging. But not necessary. Number five, and avoid, avoid both extremes. Someone who has a word from God every day makes me nervous. You know, someone, someone has a prophecy about everything, that spooks me. But you know what also spooks me? Someone who doesn't believe that God speaks. That scares me. You mean the God of the universe no longer speaks? Someone who says, I don't believe any of that. I don't believe that God, the Holy Spirit, does any of these things anymore. That, I think, is an equally dangerous extreme. And so I pray that we'd be a people hovering towards the middle of those two, gracious, allowing God to speak through us. I was, uh, today, I'm throw this out to you. Today, I was with my friend Lauren, who's a part of this church here, and he was sharing about ministry to refugees in the city. And he was sharing about the need for, for young ladies to befriend refugees who are in their early 20s who are new to America, from Afghanistan, from Iraq, from Northern Africa, who have no connection with the U.S. culture. And something just hit me that I'm going to throw out to you to test it. Some of you, God is calling to befriend these refugees, specifically ladies, befriend them, love them in the name of Jesus, help them with English, show them, what, show them what shopping is all about, integrate them into the culture. Seriously, just to love these people in the name of Jesus. And if you do that, God will use you. Now, that may not be you. But if it is you, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. We're going to worship. The prayer room is going to be open. If that's you, I'm going to ask that you'll simply trust that God will do what he said he'll do and that you're going to go to the prayer room and you're gonna simply give your name and your cell phone number. That's your act of faith. And someone, Lauren, will contact you about how you can be used by God. Now, th that could be normal. Anybody could do that. But I believe when I heard that, something just jumped within me. Jose, this is for some ladies at the way. And so I throw that out to you. Now, if you're a guy, I wasn't speaking to you, so test this. Not for you. <laughs> right? But if, if, if the Holy Spirit of God is impressing upon you right now, oh my gosh, I've been praying about this. Oh my gosh, this is me. Oh my gosh. Then you know what? Maybe it's you. And so don't despise the prophecy. Just test it. Go to the prayer room, give your name, give your number, hear more about it, and, and God will use you. Now, I don't know what that means. I don't know how. And I don't need to. Neither do you. We just need to obey. So the invitation is simply today to obey. Open our mind to the reality of the speaking God in whatever way makes sense for him. Are you open for that? Does that sound attractive to you? Or is it just freaky? Test the scriptures. Uh, worship band's gonna come. We're gonna continue to sing. We're gonna pray. But uh, I'm gonna ask the lights go low and I just wanna pray for you before we enter the season of worship. Because some of you, the Lord may wanna... The Lord may want to use you in this way, this week, this month. I don't know where this sits with you. But I just want to pray over you that God will continue to show you in the Scriptures how He wants to use you for the good of the body and to engage people who don't know the Gospel. Because when Ryan heard the word of prophecy, when Ryan heard that, he was cut to the heart. He repented of sin. He became a Christian.